administration. Yesterday, we passed the most member-driven and transparent rules package in history, and finally ended Democrats' authoritarian reign on our nation's capital. We restored and fully opened the People's House. Our first orders of legislative business have been exactly what we promised to the American people. We promised on day one to repeal Joe Biden's army of 87,000 new IRS agents, and yesterday we did just that. Today, we will counter the Chinese Communist Party with our Select Committee on China. We will vote to protect every American's constitutional rights with the new Select Subcommittee on the Weaponization of the Federal Government. We will also vote to stop the Biden administration from selling our strategic petroleum reserves to China. And of course, this week, as thousands prepare to stand for life in our nation's capital next week, we will continue to hold the line and protect the most vulnerable among us by bringing the Born Alive Survivors Protection Bill to the floor. And we are just getting started. House Republicans are unified and united in our effort to implement our commitment to America to save this country. And it's my honor to turn it over to my colleague, Michael Cloud, from Texas. The big note of the week is that the People's House is open for business, and I can tell you it's been awesome to see in the last week, even as we roam the halls, to see families coming together and once able once again able to, to tour the people's house. Well, this rules package was along those lines in opening up the people's house for business. This is, as the chairwoman said, the most, most member-driven process on the rules committee. This was always about the needed reforms and structures that needed to happen in Congress. Many of us and most of us ran with the understanding that Congress is broken. A lot of those issues predated all of us, but it was really beholden upon us to do something about it. And so what we saw last week is members coming together, working together to make this a member-driven body where members would be able to adequately have input on bills, where we would be able to, to honestly debate these sorts of things and come together. And I can tell you, I could not be more proud of our conference coming together, working together through these issues and giving us a Congress, not the kind of top-down Congress we see from the left where it, they talk about unity, but it's conformity. It's really made for TV government. This is the kind of government that's made for the people, where we have honest, deliberative input among the people elected to represent them. We come to an awesome, sex, successful conclusion, and we're ready to work for the people. Last night's bill was a great example of that. We're going to see a lot of progress going forward and uh, could not be more excited about where this conference is at this point. God bless y'all. We will now hear from the gentleman from Nebraska, Adrian Smith, who was the lead on the bill to repeal the IRS agents. Thank you, Elise, and thank you to the entire team here. Uh, last night's legislation is about taxpayers. Uh, it's about empowering taxpayers who are trying to just do the right thing in, in paying their taxes uh, without having to face <clears throat> more and more IS, IRS resources, I think randomly uh, out, uh, out to place all these audits across the economy <clears throat> without being as diligent and customer service oriented as they should be. And I, I told my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, let's work together to address the customer service needs that are absolutely needed uh, all, all across uh, the IRS. Uh, because there, there are problems, uh, clearly. That, there's bipartisan agreement that there, there are problems at the IRS. So the first step is to draw back uh, these, these dollars that I think were so randomly placed uh, and then start over uh, so that we can meet the needs of, of taxpayers and the American people uh, all across uh, America. So next uh, up is Anthony D'Esposito, uh, uh, featuring uh, a freshman. Great to have uh, an expanded team here. And uh, he flipped a seat in New York, and we're glad he's on the team. Well, thank you, and good morning. It's great to be here uh, with everyone. And most important, during the campaign, we make promises. And what's nice to hear today from our leadership is those promises that we made, we are going to keep. And I am excited, as a retired New York City detective, as someone who has spent his entire adult life in the public safety world, I'm excited that our leadership has put the protection of law enforcement at the forefront. As Democrats and the far radicals wage war, especially in New York, against those who wear the uniform, I'm honored to be part of a group, a group that stands with the men and women who protect and serve, a group that stands to protect us and make sure that we hold accountable those who take oaths to prosecute and protect us. And I'm excited and look forward 
to the coming weeks and the 118th Congress, where we will put forth our commitment to America and continue to protect the United States of America and the men and women who serve it. Thank you. And I will turn it over to our Majority Whip, Tom Emmer. Thank you. Uh, good morning. I, I guess uh, I'm going to dovetail in where, uh, where Michael Cloud started. I, last week was historic. I, you know, most of those deals usually take place uh, behind closed doors long before uh, anybody gets to see how the sausage is really made. We'll remember that Nancy Pelosi uh, gave all kinds of things two years ago just to uh, uh, stay uh, by the slimmest of margins uh, as the speaker. Kevin McCarthy, on the other hand, uh, in our conference last week, what you saw was uh, democracy at work. What you saw were people, as Michael said, representing their districts, coming to Washington, D.C., sitting down with each other in spite of differences, in spite of different perspectives, uh, and being able to ultimately, ultimately hammer out an agreement where they can work together. And it was misreported, I believe, yesterday uh, that uh, all of this was one thing. Uh, the rules package last night was very basic. Uh, with the exception of some uh, church language, I think our leaders said, uh, there really were no changes. These were voted on before, uh, that and the motion to vacate that went from five members down to one. Uh, the other agreement is an agreement that the entire conference is going to hold themselves to and their leadership. Uh, it has to do with single subject matter bills. It has to do with uh, eliminating Christmas trees, and I think Morgan Griffith said it best. Uh, we're not going to see any longer if we enforce uh, these uh, uh, agreements amongst ourselves. We're not going to see where the House sends over a coin bill to the Senate, which uh, is a ceremonial uh, type uh, piece of legislation, which they sit on and then ultimately they strip it and they fill it with, uh, I believe it was the Inflation Reduction Act, and they send it back uh, is uh, the coin bill. Uh, that will no longer uh, be acceptable in the House, uh, which I, I would argue, I, and I, I think we heard this from one of our members this morning in conference, Morgan Griffith, uh, this will arguably not make Kevin McCarthy a weaker speaker. This will make Kevin McCarthy perhaps the strongest speaker in modern times, uh, this agreement. And there'll be more on that to come. The good news for us, the people that are standing up here, is we started to become a team last week. There's 222. Uh, this is a great time to be a Republican in Washington, D.C., in the House, because you have a chance to make a difference, and you have a chance to be part of a great team that is going to work together. And I, I think you saw that starting to happen last week. Uh, have we arrived? No. No, not yet. Uh, we'll continue to get better at this together. Uh, and sadly for all of you in this room, uh, the better we get, the more boring we're going to be. So thank you. <laughs> Well, uh, thank you to our whip. Uh, good morning to all of you, and it is exciting to be here as part of the new Republican House majority. Uh, we've already started to get to work. You saw last night we passed the rules package. I know uh, a number of, of members of the press were asking me yesterday morning even, you know, are you going to pass the rules package? And we said, of course we are, because the rules package is a culmination of member meetings, negotiations that have been going on for months, frankly. And then you saw last week there were a lot of conversations about changing the way that Washington works. And that's really at the heart of what the rules changes addressed last night that passed ultimately overwhelmingly by our members because Washington has been broken. I don't think you have to do a poll to know people across the country have recognized that Washington's broken. Washington just has not been working for the families, the millions of hardworking people across this country who are struggling under the weight of all the reckless policies passed, signed into law by Joe Biden, passed by Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer uh, for two years, where you've seen devastating inflation as a result of their reckless spending. You've seen incredibly high costs at the grocery store, everything you buy because of the reckless decisions made in Washington, energy costs through the roof because of the reckless decisions made in Washington, an open border that has not only led to millions of people coming into our country illegally. Last year alone, uh, the, the number of people that came here illegally are more than the people in the state of New Mexico. That's how many people came in illegally just last year. The fentanyl deaths, more than 100,000 of our young people died last year because of the fentanyl coming across our southern border. And what was Washington doing to address those problems? Not a thing. And in fact, they shut out the ability for members like us who wanted to solve these problems on behalf of the 750,000 plus people we represent. 
And so we knew that needed to change. In fact, that's one of the reasons we won the majority. And we ran on a platform of changing Washington. And that started last week. And you saw that debate. And it was a healthy debate. Frankly, it was a debate that needed to happen years ago. And so once we got through that, we had to formalize it in the rules package, and we did. And then we went to work. And the first thing we did is delivering on the promises that we made during the campaign. We made a commitment to America. We said the first bill we're going to take up is the bill to repeal those 87,000 IRS agents. And Adrian Smith is now, you have the, uh, the, the plaque? So he's got the plaque. Uh, with the result of the vote, 221 votes yesterday, every Republican voted for it, every Democrat voted against it. And think about this. Yesterday, every Democrat won on record saying that they want to more than double the size of the IRS, age, uh, of the IRS to go after people like the hardworking families, the, the single mom who's working two shifts at a restaurant. Uh, the CBO confirmed that when they added those IRS agents, it wasn't just to go after the millionaires and billionaires. It was to go after people making less than $200,000 a year. Broke President Biden's pledge. We actually had an amendment when that bill was going through to say that the new IRS agents couldn't go after people making less than $400,000 to hold President Biden to his own pledge. Do you know every Democrat voted against that amendment? And so those IRS agents would be set up to go after hardworking families across this country. Frankly, what we need is more Border Patrol agents securing America's border, not IRS agents going after hardworking families in America. And so we passed that bill. And we're going to pass more good bills this week. You're going to see us today set up the Select Subcommittee on China to finally confront the challenge that is one of the greatest threats to our nation. Uh, and that is what the Chinese Communist Party has been doing uh, all around the globe, uh, making challenges to our country and other countries around the world. Uh, we're going to set up that church committee to look at some of these federal agencies that are weaponizing government to go after families across this country based on their political views. That's not what government should be doing. We're going to be looking into that as well. We're going to pass the Born Alive Act. This is a bill we talked about a long time. In fact, every Republican was a co-sponsor of this bill last Congress, and Nancy Pelosi wouldn't bring it up to a vote. And in our first full week, we're going to actually bring that bill up for a vote. Ann Wagner's bill that says if a baby's born alive outside the womb, in some states they actually are allowing that baby to be killed and calling it abortion. It's murder, and yet it's legal in some states. Even people that identify as pro-choice think that that's disgusting and immoral and shouldn't be allowed in America, and yet it is. And so we're going to confront that, too. And then we're going to set up our committees. You saw yesterday we finished out the chairmanships. We're going to start populating the committees. And then the committees are going to get to work bringing bills out that will actually address inflation, allow us to lower costs for families, fighting for those families who have had nobody fighting for them in Washington for years, for way too long. Washington has needed to change. And last week we started that process. Last night we culminated it with the rules package. And now we get to work implementing it. And that's ultimately what matters, is getting the job done for those families who are struggling all across this country. And we're excited and we're up to the challenge. We're ready to get to work. With that, we'll be happy to take your questions. Yes, sir. I have two questions. The first for you and then the other for Congressman Emmer. Um, the first is, given all that we know now about what Congressman Santos lied about his resume, the various inquiries into him at the federal and local level, do you think that he should be a member of Congress? Well, you saw him seated last week. There were no challenges to that. This is something that's being handled internally. Obviously, there were concerns about uh, what we had heard. And so we're going to have to sit down and talk to him about it. And that's something that we're going to deal with, uh, just like there's a lot of other things we're going to deal with. But do you and, and, and Michael, I have a second question for Congressman Tom. Um, you were in the negotiations last week. There's a lot of conversation around whether or not there's this three-page addendum, these other <laughs> negotiations and deals that were made with Freedom Caucus members. Can you confirm, like, is there an addendum? Is this an official piece of paper? Or is this just a word-of-mouth agreement? There's, a, there's no addendum. Uh, I wouldn't call it an addendum. I think our speaker put it up on the screen today and showed people. It uh, reinstitutes the Holman rule. It eliminates the Gephardt rule. Uh, there will be single subject matter uh, uh, bills. There will be uh, germaneness uh, issues are going to be important. 
uh, he made it very clear that there were no uh, uh, gavels given out. There were no deals like that that were made. This is, uh, I, I think it's more than just aspirational. I think it literally is something that the entire conference is going to want to hold ourselves to and, frankly, hold our uh, partners on the other side of the building to. Uh, but I wouldn't call it an addendum because that was the confusion yesterday. We were voting on a rules package that literally had some minor uh, wording changes in the church language and then had the motion to vacate number changed. This uh, discussion is about something totally separate. And in fact, uh, somebody from downtown, I understand, was circulating a document saying, this is the addendum that you're voting. Well, no, that's something totally separate. And I think uh, the majority leader can certainly comment on it. So can Michael, that uh, I think the uh, speaker literally put a, a, uh, a screen up today showing everybody what's in it. Why not release to the public all these deals that were reached, this, this, this screenshot that was shown in conference? You guys talk about transparency. Isn't it essential for the American public to understand exactly what deals were cut in order for them to get the truth? Well, the, the, the speaker talked about that today and, and some of the things involved, making sure that our committees are represented by a full swath of our membership. It wasn't any person was committed a committee, but look, we've got a lot of different groups within our conference. The Democrats do as well, by the way, and we want to make sure, and this is something the steering committee is going to take up. Uh, so again, it wasn't like this person's allowed that spot on a committee. The steering committee is going to make that decision. But if we're going to be able to do our business, I'd love for the Democrats to vote with us. For example, this week, we're going to have a bill to say if the Strategic Petroleum Reserve is rated like President Biden has rated it over and over again, taking over 40 percent of our nation's reserve away, not to fix a national emergency, but to mask his really bad anti-American energy policies, then it shouldn't be sold to China. I hope every Democrat votes with us to say that America's national reserve for oil shouldn't be sold to China, like President Biden did recently. Uh, but if Democrats don't work with us to solve these problems, we're going to still do it on our own. And so that means the committees have to produce bills that come out of committee that represent the full swath of our conference. And so that's the that's something the steering committee is going to take up. And those decisions, but those let's recognize those decisions haven't been finalized yet because the steering committee starting tomorrow will go in to take up all of the committee's slots that have to be filled. The ratios have to be finalized. And then ultimately, uh, you know, what bills come to the floor? Those are decisions through regular order that are going to be established. You know, we'll have a term limits bill that we're going to bring to the floor. But it was clear it's got to go through regular order. Uh, which means we're going to have committees in person again. By the way, last night, not only did we get rid of proxy voting, we got rid of virtual hearings in committees. So committees can't be meeting in these Brady Box style boxes where nobody's in a room and everybody's in some remote location and you can't even discuss an amendment. We're going to be back in person again and we're going to be having field hearings. Uh, we're going to have uh, the Judiciary Committee having a hearing on this open border at the border. We could actually go have that hearing at the place where the problem is happening. That's going to be exciting for people to see. Yeah. As far as hearing now, once again, the Mr. McCarthy wants to you know, block Mr. Swalwell, Mr. Schiff, and Ms. Omar from their committees. Now, we've seen this you know, thing before with Marjorie Taylor Green and Mr. and Mr. Gosar. Is it going to be the same process where it, in, where it will involve the entire Congress, or will it be a different process considering it will involve the intel committee? Can you explain what the process will be? Yeah, well, first of all, nobody has been assigned to uh, any of those committees yet. But as we see what comes out, the Democrats set a precedent that we urge them strongly not to go uh, down last Congress. They decided that they were going to break the, the precedent that had been in place over 200 years and remove members of the opposing party that our party selected to be on committees. And so that was a practice they set. And so obviously we're going to be looking very closely at who they appoint. They hadn't appointed anybody yet to committees, but we're going to see if they do. What has been agreed to on the debt ceiling uh, specifically? There seems to be some confusion. And can you guarantee that you will not be involved on our debt? Well, let, let's first make very clear why the debt ceiling gets hit. And I think this is an important education process to have now and an important conversation to have now because we haven't hit the debt ceiling yet. But America, over time, occasionally hits the debt ceiling because it's like a credit card limit. And families back home, have, if they have credit cards, they have a limit on that credit card. And if they hit their limit or they're very close to it, which we are, 
it means you've spent more money than you have. You've, you've spent more money than you, your credit card has allowed you to spend. And if you're going to ask for an increase in the limit, at some point in time, you've got to sit down and say, why are we hitting the limit? Why are we maxing out the credit card? Because uh, this is the nation's credit card. And frankly, it's not us but next generations that are going to have to pay this. Debt is not something that's just in, innocuous. It's going to ultimately have to pay, be paid by somebody, and that's future generations. And so if the country is spending more money than we have, and it's trillions of dollars, by the way, and Joe Biden, you saw uh, trillions and trillions of dollars in bills to rack up debt that ultimately somebody's going to have to pay. There is no free lunch. And so if we're about to max out the credit card, then before we hit that limit, shouldn't we have an honest conversation about how to start living within our means, how to make sure we're not spending money that we don't have before that comes up? And when that comes up, at the same time you're dealing with the debt limit, you ought to also put in mechanisms in place so that you don't keep maxing it out. Because if the limit gets raised, you don't go to the store the next day and just max it out again. You start figuring out how to control the spending problem. And this has been going on for way too long, and we're going to confront this, and I think the American people have called on us to confront this problem. Yes, back in the back. We're going to go in the back. Yeah. No, and in fact, we haven't talked about reducing defense spending. We've talked about bringing accountability to government. A government has needed accountability for a long time, and we've seen none of that over the last two years. You know, whether it's the origins of COVID, where everybody in America has asked that question at some point in time. You know, we were told it was, you know, some bat biting a cat, and the cat bit some guy in the wet market in Wuhan. Uh, and now scientists are looking at it saying that's probably not what, ha what happened. It's probably a genetically manipulated disease that was probably manipulated in the lab in Wuhan, and yet Democrats refuse to let us even talk about that over the last two years. We're going to be investigating things like that. We're going to talk about accountability on spending in every federal agency. And if agencies are, if there's waste, fraud, and abuse in any agency, it's got to be rooted out. And so that's what we've been talking about is how to aggressively root out waste, fraud, and abuse with taxpayer dollars. And it started with the IRS bill last night that Adrian passed. Right over here. We'll welcome to you next. Wait, I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? Speaker, Speaker McCarthy laid that out today to the membership. And again, there's still some decisions that have to be made, like the steering committee uh, will be meeting to fill out the rest of the committees. Uh, that hasn't been decided yet. Uh, we don't even know which members are going to go for which committees in some of those cases. But at the end of the day, we want our committees to reflect our conference if we want to get bills out to the floor uh, to pass, because as the whip knows, you don't want to wait until a bill's on the floor to recognize that there might be an issue. You take care of those issues in committee, and that's why you want the entire conference represented, the different groups in, within our conference represented on the various committees, and we're going to be working and to do that Steve, right here. Steve, Steve. Oh, I find it hard to you believe. You want to come in? A, no, no. I find it hard to believe that you all don't have a copy of the screenshot already. <laughs> that's We usually hear about that. We'll go here, and then we'll go to Chad's. Well, first of all, do we really know that for years, when Vice President Biden left office, it looks like he took classified documents with him, and he was very critical of President Trump. By the way, the only person that has the constitutional ability to declassify any documents is the President of the United States, not the Vice President. So if then Vice President Biden took classified documents with him and held them for years and criticized President, former President Trump during that same time that he had those classified documents, and only after it was uncovered did he turn them back. I wonder why the press isn't asking the same questions of him as vice president taking classified documents that they were asking President well, Trump. Actually, the Justice Department would indicate even what, about, what about the, you know, looking at that vote last year for the speaker, the series of votes here, why should we not think that almost every one of these big policy issues that you're going to endure is going to be right on the edge 
three or four votes, all the drama, whether it be cutting spending, even the abortion bill, some of these things are very controversial. Why is that passed not so long for the rest of the next few years? Well, with a five-seat majority, if, if you have a few people that are, that are absent because they're family issues back home, you know, we saw that. Some members had to get back home to a, to a loved one that had a health that issue. And that, and that ultimately is something, look, nobody said any, any of this is going to be easy. Fixing the problems of the country is complicated because they're huge problems. These aren't small problems that our country is facing. The good news is we've got a majority that all, from various philosophies, people from different walks of life, all came here to help solve problems. And these are big problems. It's going to take a lot of work. It's going to take committees doing a lot of work to ultimately get the policy right. What's important is not the margin of the vote, but making sure we get the policies right to fight for those hardworking families who have been left behind by Washington for far too long. And it's going to be an exciting process to watch. I think people are going to be tuned in like they were last week. Look forward to talking to you soon.